the Vox Markets podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Welcome to the podcast on Tuesday, the 13th of October, 2020. On the podcast today, Clive Beatty, Acting Chief Executive Officer of On The Market, discusses some of the highlights from the interim results and future outlook. Also on the podcast, Mike Ralston, CEO of Brencar Resources, that's B-R-E-S, ticker, provides an operational update on their graphite project. And Vadim Alexander, Head of Healthcare at SP Angel, discusses Novasite, Polarian Imaging, Diurnal Group, and Feedback PLC. Plus, at the end of the podcast, I'll be highlighting two lists for you, the top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours, and the top five most liked RNSs too. By the way, you can see top 10 visions of both these lists at voxmarkets.co.uk where you'll see lots of other content and our COVID-19 index. What's the biggest rise of the day? It is Way Education up 5.7% to 27.5. Biggest faller, React Group down 5.66 to 1.25 pence. Check that out at voxmarkets.co.uk. Vox Markets is an online community of investors that runs a free mobile and desktop platform that allows you to track news and updates about any UK listed company. Offering RNS push notifications, detailed charts, pricing data and much more. Find out more at voxmarkets.co.uk forward slash app. And joining me on the podcast right now is Clive Beatty, Acting Chief Executive Officer of On The Market, OTMP. Clive, thanks for joining me. Good morning, Justin. Glad to be here. Yeah, and some decent metrics out. Uh, seems like uh, it's improving there. Uh, you know, it's coming on nicely on the market. You've got your interim results up for six months, ended July, and we'll uh, dig into those in a bit. As always, though, Clive, if there is someone listening who's never heard of On The Market, can you explain what you're about, please? Of course. Uh, so On The Market is a property portal, uh, onthemarket.com, where uh, agents and new home developers will list properties for sale or to rent, uh, and people can go onto the portal and search uh, in their criteria in their area uh, and look for homes to buy or let, uh, and we put the two together. Yeah, and uh, as I said, if you look at the metrics, it's improving. Even post-period, you can see the story's going in the right direction. So, first of all, let's dig into the, uh, the, you know, the half year, and then we'll go into the post-period if you could. So, take us through some highlights, if you could, Clive, from the first six months of the year. Yeah, and of course, the first six months, uh, we, like every every business in the in the world, probably has been impacted by COVID nineteen, uh, which occurred in the period. Um, and what that meant for us really is that we uh, we chose to give discounts to our uh, customers, our, our agents, uh, because they obviously during lockdown faced very difficult circumstances, weren't able to do transactions and get cash themselves. Um, but actually, notwithstanding that, we were very pleased. We had half year on half year growth still of revenues of twenty eight percent. Uh, and, that, and that's after giving away those discounts. Um, so, you know, that was still quite pleasing that we're still showing growth over overall. Uh, and actually what was most pleasing perhaps is that, you know, we had to take our own actions to conserve our own cash, to mitigate our own costs because of those uh, the COVID-19 impacts. Um, and, and we did that successfully. So actually the period for us was a profitable period, a small profit, but actually, you know, it's the first profitable period since, uh, since this thing. So, you know, that's a good thing to see. And it's impressive, I think, that we can control our costs, but at the same time, see very strong consumer engagement. Um, uh, and that was true both to July. Now, up to July, because of COVID-19, it was only the last uh, couple of months that started to see that really active market once again and the, and the engagement. Uh, but that has continued post, uh, you mentioned post year end. And the quarter to September, so just ended, has been our record quarter for both traffic with something like 80 million visits, uh, but also for leads with 5.9 million leads. So you know, it shows that even though we've reduced significantly our marketing expenditure, we are sufficiently we have sufficient traction with active consumers or active in the property market uh, consumers that we are generating value for our advertisers, notwithstanding that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like I said, considering you know pretty much the market or the economy was shut for two three months of the year. That's quite impressive. And so going forward now, how do you, how do you improve on these? Because I know, you know some people who listen may not be aware, but you do have, you introduce some estate agents uh, for free or discounted rates. Is that changing? Are those, those, are those now agents coming off that free uh, fee or tariff or, or the, are you putting them back at the normal yeah. tariff? No, I think you hit, hit on a good point there, Justin, which is you know, going forward, what's important for us is to convert more of the branches onto paying contracts 
uh, and indeed over time onto full tariff contracts because we do offer discounted paying contract rates as well. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, not so much during the period, but post period end, we are now engaging with agents who have been on free, and we did extend the free period. So you know these would have come up for, to the end of their contracts some while ago. But actually, because of COVID nineteen, again we thought it was inappropriate to try and charge people or throw them off at that point. Um, but we are now engaging with those agents, and you know where they're not uh, uh, willing at this point to sign up to paying agent uh, paying contracts, we will unfortunately have to remove them but very much to stay engaged with them going forward. And as I say, we do have a range of contracts we can offer them, both discounted rates that are shorter-term contracts, if, if that's where they are at the moment, because things are still a bit uncertain. But also you'll remember that actually we, we have shares to give away. So we have actually signed quite a few hundred more uh, share-based contracts uh, during the COVID period, during uh, I think 581 during the half year to July. Um, and actually, if you look at those, once those shares are issued, we'll have something like 3,800 agents as shareholders and between them operating about 6,800 offices, mm. which is clearly a significant portion of the market that is actually then financially invested as shareholders uh, in the success of on the market. So we think that aligns us very well with agents and we have more shares to give away if uh, if some of these free, free of charge agents that we're having to remove now, uh, they, they can take share-based contracts and come back. So we're hoping that in the coming months, you know, we'll continue to engage with those people and we'd hope to see them back on the on the portal, but under a paying contract. Yeah. And I suppose at the end of the day, if you are showing them value for money, and like you say, your you know, your leads are going up. I mean, I think the last report before this was 149 average leads per month. And that's compared to like 170 for the, the market leader, which is 90 times your valuation, which is right move. If you're showing them that value for money, then surely they'll come back, won't they? Well, we clearly we hope so. I think you know we are very good value for money. We are very competitive on the on the cost side of the listing fees. Um, you know we've now got something in excess of nine thousand four hundred agents underpaying contracts. So clearly, a lot of agents in the market do see value there, uh, and we you know obviously want that to increase. But um, but the key for us is to keep moving forward. So actually, you know recently we've launched some initiatives on uh, data analytics to actually analyze uh, and try and more effectively market through social media and other channels uh, to consumers and therefore not just generate more leads but generate better quality of leads uh, leads earlier in the cycle and in the proxy moving cycle of the consumer um, which are the kind of leads that you know our, our customers will value the most so you know it's an ongoing thing you know we're certainly not resting on our laurels we want to deliver ever more value and, and in time that will also be through not just enhancing the current things we're doing, but also differentiating the portal from, from the competitors, uh, offering different products and services that hopefully agents will also find useful and valuable. Yeah. And do you sense you're getting, because obviously it takes a long time to establish yourself as a brand in this market. There's a lot of marketing money needed, you know, to, to get, get up there for people to download the app. But do you feel like now, now you're getting, you know, a decent amount of traction, you know, and uh, I know you've had a sort of, you stopped marketing for a while, but are, are you back to marketing now on, on, uh, on radio, TV and all that social media? We, we have started marketing again, um, and we'll we'll mix the channels through which we do that, uh, depending on what we think is the most appropriate. So, you know, it could be radio, TV, it could be digital, uh, you know, it could be a mix of things. And as I say, increasingly, social media and and led by data analytics, uh, rather than uh, rather than just the sort of standard use. Um, yeah. But that has started again. I mean, I think what we've been pleased with uh, in the period we're reporting on is that we were able to conserve our cash. Indeed, you know, the cash at the year end was. 9.8 uh, million at the end of July with a couple of million of deferred creditors. Uh, but actually at the end of September, that increased to 10.3 million with a couple of million of deferred creditors. Um, mm -hmm. So actually the cash conservation has been good. We've now got to maintain that discipline, that financial discipline uh, as we go forward and start to market more. Uh, and one of the bits of guidance we gave within our interim statement was to say that although we anticipate both revenues and costs will be higher in the second half than the first half, because obviously we'll start uh, unwinding the discounts for COVID brigade customers, but also we'll start spending more on, on advertising. Nevertheless, we think actually that for the year as a whole, we, we're still targeting a, a break even at the adjusted operating profit line. So again, I think that, that financial discipline hopefully will stand us in good stead uh, when, when investors come to cast their eye over us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so one of the things, of course, is, is, is a two-way street kind of thing. You need, you need uh, the eyeballs on the app, of course, and, and the users. But uh, to get those users, you need the stock levels as well. And, and obviously, the last big sort of signing you announced there was uh, Taylor Wimpy. How's the, the housing, uh, new houses going? 
Well, the new homes has been uh, we've been very very pleased with. Um, we only launched into that sector of the market in September last year, September nineteen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and as you say, year end we were oh, sorry, a period end end of July we we're at fifteen hundred. Uh, new homes developments. I mean, that's already grown almost to 1,700 uh, at the end of September, uh, with Taylor Wimpy coming on, amongst others. So, you know, very good. We've got we've got seven of the ten largest house builders are now on on the market. dot com, um, and, and that's something we want to see continue. And, and clearly, that additional stock is is helping with the eyeballs and the consumer traffic. Uh, I think the other thing, and we've talked about it before, but the other thing I think still helps with consumer traffic, and particularly the most active or, or you know the hottest buyers in the market is our new and exclusive offering where agents put properties on to on the market before other uh, portals or before right move and zoopla um, and i think for the for the you know the keenest house buyers you know they want to see properties as soon as they're on the market so they sign up get alerts from us so that they can do that i i do you know i do that i've got uh, alerts exactly the same like i said before exactly the same alerts for you and right move and i've got to say I'm getting uh, more frequent emails of late from you, and uh, in fact, in, e- in fact, when you often get an email from you, it's normally followed you know, later by right move. So that's that's very encouraging. It just shows you know you have stock levels, and that's that's very impressive. And that, that's the reason why I downloaded the app. I listened to the radio advert saying you had new and exclusive so up to 24 hours ahead of others, and I thought let's give it a dr- give it a try. And, and it's right to say, and to me, that's very powerful. That. I, I think it is. Well, I'm glad it's working for you. Uh, it's very good to hear. But no, I think it is powerful. And um, you know, in, in many ways, it's one of the things that uh, is difficult for the others to uh, to copy because this is the agents of their free choice doing it. Um, it helps the vendor as well because actually the vendor of that property uh, enjoys when, when it's exclusive with us. We actually promote it to the top of the search uh, engine results. Um, we also show uh, bigger picture, you know, more pictures, bigger presentations. So actually you get an enhanced launch of the house uh, if you're if you're the vendor, so I think there's you know it's a win-win situation for all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, are, there, are there any, any milestones? I know is it in December that the new CEO starts? Are there? I mean, you, you've seen done very well uh, standing in here, Clive, acting CEO. Are there any milestones you want to achieve before you hand over the new CEO? Well, I think it's just you know we've got to continue with the business and and uh, growing it as we have. Uh, and look, I mean, it's kind of you to say so. I mean, I'd like to thank uh, all all of the staff really. I mean, it's been. A real privilege to be able to lead the team in what have been some pretty turbulent times uh, but actually the whole team across the board you know all the colleagues i'm working with have been fantastic both in my you know, in their support for me but also just their dedication and professionalism to the business and i think if anything you know that, that's going to stand us in very good stead you know that sort of team commitment uh, and as you say jason teb joins us in december um, and we're looking forward to that because jason has got agency experience that actually within the senior team currently we don't really have so you know, he's been in the agency markets for 20 odd years now. And I think particularly coming to our sort of medium term growth, where we're looking to actually differentiate the portal, uh, offer a different proposition through uh, additional products and services. You know, his understanding of what agents need, what they face day to day in terms of the challenges, you know, will help us shape that you know, far more effectively, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Clive, as always, if someone's listening that likes the sound of the progress you're making but are not yet following the story, uh, Jeff's given three quick reasons why they should hit that follow button on your page on Vox Market and add on the market to their watch list, please. Of course. Uh, so I think the first is, is the performance uh, that I touched on, the consumer engagement. You know, we, we do seem to be very actively uh, engaged with consumers who are active in the property market, and that obviously should help us in our marketing to agents and therefore for our revenue growth prospects in the short term, uh, you know, for turning people onto paying contracts. Um, the second is the differentiated proposition, the fact that actually we are so widely owned by agents, as I said, uh, with the new agent contracts we've signed up, that'll get us to 6,800 branches. You know, there hasn't been a portal that's been owned in that way before. Uh, the other portals that had agent ownership tended to be the big two or three agents, you know, a few small handful uh, with a reasonable stake rather than a very broad spread amongst agents. So that's that's a thing we want to see more agents join behind us and get behind them. Um, and then finally, I think the strong management and the strong financial discipline, uh, you know, particularly in these current times, it's important to have been able to operate the portal, but to conserve our own cash. And I think that management strength will only be enhanced when Jason joins us in, in December. So that also augurs well. Excellent stuff. Clive, good to chat to you and uh, hopefully we'll catch up in the not too distant future. Thanks very much. Lovely. Thank you, Justin. Cheers. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waits. And joining me on the podcast right now is Mike Rawlson, CEO of Blenco Resources. BRS is ticker there. Mike, thanks for joining me. Thank you very much for having me again. 
Yeah, it's good to get you on. And like I always say, you know, keep coming on. Uh, you know, reminding people about the story. If it's a good story, evolve the story. So it's nice to get you on, just to talk, take us through where you're at. Because, of course, even though you're doing things backstage there uh, that we can't see, there's always, uh, you know, there's always things being developed and you're always moving the project forward. So it's very good. So we'll get into uh, the detail in a bit. Before we do, Mike, just, just a brief summary for people not maybe familiar because you haven't been listed long. Blenko Resources, explain what it's about, please. Okay, Blenko acquired the um, world-class Orem Cross Graphite project in April 2020. Um, it's located in Uganda, in Africa. Um, it's an absolutely sensational project, um, size and scale, low cost, and we're going to develop it into a market that we think is growing in terms of graphite demand for electric vehicles in particular. So that's what we're all about, and we're having a lot of success as we develop it already. Excellent stuff. Well, let's, 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 let's talk about that. So give us now what the current status is of the Orem Cross uh, Graphite project, if you could, Mike. So where we are at the moment is that we picked up this project, what, six months ago, um, mm-hmm. and we had a, a very um, short time frame to get on the ground and start drilling for a jork resource. We've done that. We've completed a 2,000-meter drill program, diamond drilling for 69 holes, which we anticipate is going to give us approximately first 10 years life of mine. Those samples have all been sent off to Tanzania, which is the nearest accredited lab for preparation. And some of those samples will thereafter be going off to Canada, to the SGS labs for phase two met test work. And some of it will be going down to South Africa to get our chalk resource put together. So we've added value already in the first six months, and we're going to continue to do that going forward. Yeah, well, in fact, let, let's, let's talk about going forward here. So you mentioned a bit there what's going to happen, uh, but what, what are exactly the next steps and then the plan for next year? So the first thing we've got to do is put a jork resource on this project. Um, everybody can see that there's literally two to three billion tons of graphite there near to surface, but one has to do, do it properly. And the first step of getting into a feasibility study and ultimately production is getting that jork resource. So that will be um, done over the next couple of months. Um, And in parallel to that, as I said before, um, we've got one of the most experienced labs in terms of graphite development, uh, SGS out of Toronto, um, lined up to do MET test work. And what that will do is show us what our end product is going to look like. Um, So by early 2021, both the JORC and the MET test work done, we can then move forward to, I guess, 2021 is all about the studies, um, a scoping study or pre-feasibility to ultimately show the commercial outcomes for that 10 years of life of mine. And we have a very high expectation of what the results are going to be in that study. Um, we think we're going to show a project of some considerable value. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and let's take sort of a wider view here. You know, people listening may think, okay, uh, the graphite market, of, of course, is involved in electric vehicles, but uh, give us a bit more detail on the market there and, and, and the projections for it, if you could, Mike. Yeah, there are two distinct markets. I think you get large to jumbo-sized flakes um, in your project, um, and with the concentrate, you can work on going into what's called the expandables market. Graphite has a very um, high heat resistance, so it's used in things like lining steam, steel foundries, um, et cetera, and um, fire retardants, et cetera, and, and that's a solid 5 to 10% growth market. Um, you get the highest prices for that. In, in the range of somewhere between a thousand, two thousand US dollars per ton. On the other side, for the smaller flakes, for the fines, um, that's where um, a certain type of flake graphite is used um, basically to upgrade and go into the lithium ion batteries to make up the anode part of that battery. Mm-hmm. And it's that EV growth, um, the prediction of a surging EV market, um, that's where everybody, including ourselves, is, is getting very excited about where this can go. We think approximately half our graphite will be going into this, um, which is a, a stronger demand growth market, um, but will probably get lesser prices. And then the other side of it, as I said, is into the large and jumbo flakes. Um, just in terms of that EV growth strategy, um, I see recently that Tesla have just recorded their largest production volumes ever in the last quarter. Um, so there's definitely growth happening from their side, um, just as a on-the-ground um, example. Um, there's no question that the renewables, renewable energy market is also surging. Um, there's 
huge amount of talk about where that's going to go. Um, China has recently come out and said it's going to be fossil free past 2060, which seems a long way away, but it's got a long pathway to, to obviously changing from being the world's largest user of fossil fuels. So there is a growth in this market and we are very well, um, I guess, positioned to take advantage of that with graphite because graphite is such a key component of batteries which are needed themselves to store any energy in terms of renewables or in terms of these electric vehicles. So direct link between graphite and I suppose the renewables and the, and the battery metals market and that's really where we're positioning ourselves to produce a low cost high grade project that can be delivering considerable volumes into these markets from a safe location going forward yeah 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 as i say saying the trend is your friend and of course everything's heading towards uh, you know non fossil fuels sort of uh, electric you know vehicles uh, so uh, we're just at the start the thin end of the wedge here aren't we really as far as demand is concerned so it's only going to get bigger and better i mean and and do you say, i mean are you looking for other opportunities regionally um, or are you going to stick in with that project there well, it's very early stage in terms of our development of RM Cross, so we're obviously going to continue to develop that going forward. Um, but we are seeing the market really shifting seismically around about 2025 when demand will start really outstripping supply in terms of graphite. So we're not in a massive rush to get into production next week. Um, so we are looking at other opportunities as they arise. We've certainly got some visibility in East Africa with Orem. And we are being presented with op other opportunities, but we're pretty picky and choosy in terms of what we're looking at. And, um, you know, we will definitely consider other opportunities as they arise, but we would only um, perhaps take advantage of that if, uh, if there was something that really looked particularly enticing and develop this perhaps into a larger East African resources company um, if and when something catches our eye. But for now, certainly we're going to continue to develop Orem Cross. That's our focus. And um, we'll just continue to, to, to monitor the situation in terms of other opportunities. Yeah, marvellous stuff. Okay, Mike, well, uh, listen, every day on the podcast, I highlight the top five most followed companies. To get on that list, of course, uh, many people have to hit that follow button on your page. So if someone's listening to this, like the sound of uh, where you are and uh, the progress you're making, but are not yet following the story, give them those three quick reasons why they should hit that button and add Blenko resources to their watch list, please. Well, the first thing I would say is that if you are uh, an investor or a party that's interested in the renewable space, if you're interested in the battery metal space in terms of where that's all going, um, there's a limited uh, number of opportunities to invest in on the London Stock Exchange. Um, Blenko provides one of those opportunities. We are definitely one of the fast growing companies um, in that space. And I think that there's huge upside going forward. So that's a key um, factor for anyone to press that button. I think we've proven over the last six months since we've held this project that we are not going to sit on our thumbs. We've got out there, we've done an intensive drilling program, um, we've got MET test work going on, we're going to get our first jork out very quickly as well. So we've got a management team that understands what it needs to do and it's getting out there and doing it. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of going forward, um, we've got a clear plan and a clear path to value adding. Uh, as I say, next year we're going to be coming out with our first studies which will be able to show the commercial outcomes for this project. And I think we're going to be able to show the market that we've got something of size and scale and, and considerable value. So those are a couple of key attributes, and I hope that everybody's uh, very interested to keep watching. Excellent stuff, Mike. Good to chat to you as always. Like you say, lots going on there. So uh, no doubt we'll be catching up in the not-too-distant future. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waits. And joining me on the podcast right now is Vadim Alexander, Head of Healthcare at SP Angel. You are Vadim? How are you doing, Justin? Yeah, I'm good. I'm, do you know what? I've got to say, I'm sick of coronavirus now. Really am. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's getting boring. I, it, it didn't yeah. bother me because I work from home anyway, and it didn't change a lot. But it, I just think now it's grinding on and on and on, and I can feel yeah. this almost dark cloud. I feel I just want. I, I don't really get out of the house much anyway. I mean, I have got an office in the garden, so. <laughs> but it, it's something. It's almost like it's limiting. Uh, normally, I'd go on a couple of holidays a year. We haven't done that, and just I just want to get out there. And I also just I think it's really. There's a lot of people suffering out there. I just want to get a, you know news on a vaccine. I think will lift the market. That's what we need. And I know um, yeah. I did. Did if you saw Johnson and Johnson's um, studies being halted? 
Um, yeah. And also mm-hmm. AstraZeneca in, in the US is still halted. And these are not, yeah. these are not um, concerns, they said, uh, the, the things that this happened because they've had a reaction on one patient each. Which is, when, you, when you're testing 60,000 people like J&J is Johnson & Johnson, you're going to have uh, a reaction from somebody, you know. Uh, and um, so they've just got to halt it to see what's going on. But I just think, let's get some news out there to lift the market, you know. And uh, until then, of course, and this uh, feeds ni- nicely into what we're talking about, until then... I suppose we'll have uh, lots of testing happening, even after vaccines, of course, lots of testing. And yeah. we, we were talking about Novosite, weren't we, a couple of weeks back. We didn't understand yeah. how that news about the Department of Health contracts didn't push it up higher. It was like, I think yeah. it was like about five quid, I think it was, when we were talking about it. And uh, it's, it's moved now, isn't it? It's gone. Yeah, now it's gone. It's it's gone all the way up to almost nine quid at one point, yeah. or higher even. And uh, and it's it, I think it's found a level now at around seven, eight quid, mm. uh, or seven seven fifty. Um, so yeah, no, it's uh, now it's you know it's good to see that rally because uh, it made no sense. I mean, it, it was probably because people couldn't um, comprehend the size of the contract, which to be to be fair to everybody, it was an enormous contract. You know, a yeah. two hundred and fifty million pound contract with yeah. the potential of reloading for another. Remember, this was the three hundred first machines. You know, led to the two hundred and fifty million pound contract. Um, uh, you know, there's another potential. 700 machine order after this yeah. so you know this this could become a, a, a much much bigger contract and 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 that's so just frankly, in the uk prob- that's in the uk will. yeah that's in the uk alone so you, you know they yes. are doing uh they are doing uh you know, supplying testing kits around the world aren't they pretty much yeah yeah absolutely if they got if they got that second tri- the second part of the contract triggered i wouldn't be surprised this, if this became a billion pound company you know it's a uh, it's currently a 600, 600 yeah. something like that, 600 Just million below market cap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a 600 million market cap company. Um, and uh, and that second contract is bigger than the first, right? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, the first one is secured. The second, they're rolling it out now. The second one, you know, could be much, much bigger. Uh, so, look, the, I, I, there's only good things to come there. You're right about vaccines. I do think that at some point, we hope, for, for, for society's sake, hope to hear good news about a vaccine working. And just the very announcement itself, I think, will take the heat out of some COVID stocks. Um, mm. Novacite, I think, is one that's just, you know, it's it's motoring along uh, all the way up to that point and way beyond that point because they're actually delivering tests right now in huge volumes. And nothing really in the short term is going to change that, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Where things w- may have an impact on volumes is well into vaccination rollout. So we're going to be seeing testing all the way through the rollouts of several vaccines because we need to know who we still need to know where the virus is, you know? So we're talking well into 21 and probably uh, maybe even beyond, you know? So I'm not particularly worried about Novacite, but I think you are, you are right in saying that a vaccine announcement globally will change the dynamics around the discussions of, of, you know, stocks around COVID because several other, now we're talking about other diagnostic players on, on, on AIM. Uh, are there's a lot of heat in the stocks. You know, they they haven't sold this. You know, really haven't sold tests yet, and they have. Um, you know, their their share prices are quite hefty in some instances, right? Yeah. So there is some risk. You're right around some of the other diagnostics players. I don't think. I think Novacite. You'll probably hear more positive news on further tests uh, being ordered, uh, which will drive the share price further. So there, it is a distinct uh, diagnostics player amongst its peer group on AIM. Yeah, I think yeah. it's you know. Well, they're, yeah, they're banking them. They're banking the money, aren't they? That's the thing is, they are banking that money. So um, whatever happens here, they've still got, they've still got a, a, you know, a, a truckload of cash already, sort of there yeah. done, and so um, it's fine. So and they've got you know the business to pivot to. So um, well, the, yeah. The, the, um, do you know what though? When you see momentum get into a stock, it, and people, you know, analysts and all that, can never. Uh, you, well, you, of course you can't. You can't write in um, the momentum because you never know what companies will catch that momentum and what don't. And what, what's got a little bit of momentum at the moment? And it's been slowly building, but I think we're just at the start. Is is Polarian, and because um, we we talked about it uh, last week, um, and Richard, actually CEO, came in the podcast, and I'm still thinking. You know, I'm looking at this. It's a phase three, you know, med tech company. It's past mm-hmm. phase three. It's going for FDA, which is pretty much what, a tick box exercise, pretty much. Because let's be honest, the op- I, I said to a friend, he said, "Well, what if they don't get FDA clearance?" I said, "Listen, the option, the, the alternative to this tech, 
is a, a tech that gives you a black and white 2D image and give, puts radiation in your body. How can that? How can that be allowed? Is that this course? <laughs> of course, this will pass. It's got you know 3D images, shows lung function, all that stuff, and uh, it's not not harmful to you. I mean, they yeah. done, I mean, it, and I said when you consider it's still below 100 million market cap, and yet. I've heard someone say this is going to be the new norm in, in in pulmonary investigation equipment around the world. When you see how big the potential is, and yet was if phase three is done, you know it's done that. Then uh, sub hundred million market cap is still very cheap. I think you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I always say I'm I'm a big believer in player, and I'm a holder of player, and, and you know, the, it's it's just one that I've always, um, uh, you know, the the, the it, it's it, it is the stock i would say my top pick at the moment because and and look at the momentum i mean it's just gone from it's quadrupled since its ipo uh this is in the span of two years the company is uh, going from strength to strength it's now it's had two fit positive phase three trial results it submitted it just submitted its uh, its nda to the fda which is its its submission to get approval um they've also filed as we discussed a, for a priority review which would shorten the timeline uh, whether they get that or not, we'll find out in the next 60 days. But it doesn't really matter. But it's a nice to have if they do get it. Uh, but the real, I think, the real story here is is in many respects just begun because this could change pulmonary imaging forever. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a step change in technology. The adoption is growing very quickly in terms of um, for it's be, it's being used already in I think nearing 25 centers. They just had a machine sale the other day. Um, you know, yeah, I, you know, I googled these... that. By the way, that that, that um, in the, if the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas, I googled that. That's the biggest yeah. cancer center in in the in the US. So that's it's uh, very reputable. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. it's you know it's up there with like the Mayo Clinic. You know, there 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 is a, maybe a you know a half a dozen centers. It's one of them. You know what I mean? And so the they're selling these machines to top institutions, global institutions. You know what I mean? That that are recognized for their research. So. It, and the publication record around uh, xenon using, uh, in, you know, um, xenon as a contrast agent is yeah. growing very, very quickly. So inevitably, I think this technology, um, you know, will get recognized at, at, at some point. And it's just a question of, of pace at which it gets taken up. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the regulatory hurdle that ha- that is coming is it, you, know, you can never say with 100 percent certainty with the FDA. But I can say that it's not a really a drug. Xenon is the is the inhaled uh, component of this drug device combination business, so it had to be treated as a drug by the FDA re- by the regulator. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the downside of any surprises of uh, you know side effects is virtually nil. Uh, and in, in fact, the FDA said so to Polarian in terms of uh, you know they didn't have to do any safety trials because they know xenon so well. Yeah. Uh, xenon's used as an anesthetic at much higher doses, so the FDA has already has a file. You know, a big file on xenon. So there's there's little risk of a regulatory surprise here. Um, this is all going to become about market uptake afterwards. Uh, and right now we're seeing machines are getting purchased. Uh, the company, you know, is getting those machines out there at the top institutions, which are KOLs for the rollout that's coming. You know, hopefully in, in between eight to twelve months time now because yeah. of this uh, priority review. Yeah. So you look, do you know telling? Do you know, yeah, yeah. Do you know telling? A, a, a guy, an equity analyst, comes on the podcast every now and again, and um, in fact, every week. Uh, but he he talks. To, he's largely into bigger cap stocks, and uh, he talks to people as well, fund managers who are into bigger cap stocks. And he contacted me the other day. He said, "Oh, listen, um, the guy you just had on last week said uh, Richard from." Polarian Imaging. I just I know a well respected fund guy who's very good at picking stocks has just talked about highly about Polarian and it's starting to come on to fund managers register uh, radars now because it's nearing that hundred million market cap. And as you know, a lot of funders don't yeah. even look at companies below that uh, level. And he said he said we and this Paul said about this other guy fund manager, he, he said it looks like that become could become the standard for pulmonary investigative, you know, um, sort of tech. Yeah. And so that is yeah. huge. That is massive. Like you say, $150 billion spent in the U.S. on pulmonary sort of, um, you know, medicine alone. And then you've got Europe, and then you've got uh, the Far East, and then you've got the Middle East. So, mm-hmm. you know, we're talking sub-100 million market cap. And this is where the funds start to get interested in stocks at that level anyway. So once they start buying in, um, you know, it, it'll just... I, I, do you know what? It's one of those things, I hate to say it, but it's a 10-bagger nailed on pretty much. Um <laughs> 
you know, and uh, and I'm, I'm talking maybe maybe you know because even if you look at everything around it as well, you know, Bracker being a shareholder, them buying the Chim's last bit of tech for four hundred and fifty million dollars, and now they're into Playerian. Yeah. Playerian is a wider application, just more commercial. Yeah. Then it, it just makes you know. To me, I know there's no, no thing as a no-brainer, but this is as close to one as you can get. I I pretty much think, uh, and unless something comes from left field, let's throw. And now with COVID, like you said, long COVID affecting lungs, the market's just got bigger. You know. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. I mean, that's that's a case in point. You you put your finger on the you know the the peer is the former chairman's company sold for four hundred fifty million dollars mm. to a now shareholder strategic shareholder in Polarid, which is Braco, which um, you know has the pockets to buy companies uh, for that kind of money. And this is indeed a much much wider application technology. Yeah. So and and the important bit here is that Braco is on the board now. So they're not just a shareholder, they're a board, they're, they hold a board seat yeah. and they have a strategic input in the rollout of this technology. Let's not forget, Braco is a global imaging business, you know, mm-hmm. they, with a shareholding in this business. They have every interest to roll this out, yeah. you know, to help them roll this out. They have the distribution network to do so. They know exactly what they're doing. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, you know, this, this, the current market cap is 100 million, roughly sterling, you know, a, we've seen Bracco buy a sister business for four hundred and fifty million dollars, so for four times uplift from today's price. Um, and you know, the sky's the limit because the potential here is growing every day. We've just noted the new potential application of COVID, and then they just sold a machine to a cancer center. You know, th- there's so many applications for in pulmonary medicine mm. far beyond. Uh, and this is, you know, to, in no way knocking Blue Earth Diagnostics, which is the firm the chairman sold to Bracco, but that was within one very specific area of oncology. I think it yeah. was a prostate cancer yeah. diagnostic. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Here we're talking for about much, much wider applications. Cool. So yeah, is it yeah, possible? Yeah. You know, is it possible to see another ten times uplift? Yes, it is possible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's let's let's, uh, let's, let's move on to um, uh, Diurnal. You can talk about Diurnal. I don't. What do they do? I don't know what they do. Diurnal. They're sort of placing them. They're so the Diurnal are in the on, in the area of uh, endocrinology so it's basically hormone um, uh, endocrinology is all the, the area of hormones right so um, what they have um, basically they're a specialist in endocrinology so they 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 want to be, cor- basically become a, a specialist pharma company in that area and they're they're very they're they're well on their way they've just um, you know they just had an, an FDA approval actually we talked about this uh, about a month ago mm-hmm. we were saying one of the key upcoming dates was there, they filed for their first product, which is selling, by the way, They're, they already have a selling product. It's a, it's for an orphan indication. It's, um, it's, a, it's, it's in the area of pediatrics, it's a small indication, but you know, they're, they're doing a couple of million uh, in revenues. They're selling throughout Europe, starting to sell, you know, co- one country after another throughout Europe. They have, um, approvals, uh, that are pending in several other countries outside of Europe. I think in Israel, in Australia, New Zealand, some of them either approved or or pending. So, look, the drug is is selling and and growing in terms of its footprint. But the, the approval they just recently got was with the FDA in the U.S. So that's another positive. Mm-hmm. Um, so you'll you know we'll start to see revenues from that. But the, the you know this company is just going from strength to strength. They just raised another ten million pounds um, uh, just to, to 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 fund another pipeline drug which is in the area of testo- testosterone replacement therapy uh, which is a big area I mean it's a it's I think it's a four billion dollar market so you know they, they they have a nice pipeline to follow on the second pipeline drug after Alkindi is the one I was talking about in the beginning yeah uh, is it, the second one's called Chronicord, and they they're expecting a big um, there's a, a, an approval pending in Q1 next year so that's the next big one so I would expect you know they had their US approval for Alkindi the next big piece of news is Q1 next year uh, for U- European approval for Chronicord, that would be a game changer. If they got that approval, you know, it's a much, much bigger market um, for a, a, a drug. It's a much bigger market for a, sorry, it's a, it's a much bigger drug, has yeah. much more market potential globally. Mm-hmm. So hopefully we'll see that, you know, come through as positive. I think what we often see with these big news events is the run up to Q1 is probably going to be one of um, you often see a run up to a big announcement, so I would expect to look for that as a next phase for that company. But companies going from strength to strength like it a lot. That that ni- next pipeline drug that they just raised ten million for, um, Die Test, is uh, is big. I mean, that could be really really interesting. So that's that's the third, if you like, the third um, pipeline drug. 
Okay, cool, cool, Diana uh, there. And uh, one last guy you want to mention. Uh, I know you hold feedback. I did hold them. I'm less convinced of them now. I don't know why. And uh, feedback, because they, they, they launched this bleeper, didn't they? This communication device for the NHS. It's CE marked, which is... Um, Put some in it, it's a, a, to an advantage of other communication tools. I know there's quite a few of them around that have been using the NHS, but this is the only one at C marked. And to me, even if it's, I, I, I don't know, I, I'm not convinced it's commercial. And if it is, I don't see how big the market is there. And uh, the, I, the, apart from the, the final, <laughs> the, the final results today, um, the only positive I could see there, apart from what I already know, is they've still got a bit of cash there and uh, 4.4 million yeah, in cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, like, like a you know, so I I, I was a, I'm a holder of Polarian, big believer in that. Holder of Diurnal, big believer in that. And I'm also a holder of feedback. And this one, you know, I was a bit disappointed with the results today. I'm not saying it's terrible. There's no, it's not doesn't spell the death knell of the business or anything like that. There's nothing really bad there. But um, you know, uptake of Bleepo, I'm curious to see what happens here. You know, it's a uh, it's not cut and dry. I mean, I I kind of agree with you. It isn't. Um, you know, there, there's been a, a lot of they've raised a lot of money and there's, they've used a lot of that money. So, you know, we've seen cash balance go to, I think from about 7 million down to about four and a quarter or something like that, four and a half, uh, you know, in one year. So I'd like to kind of understand, you know, how much of that is going to translate into revenues for Bleepa. So, yeah, we, we know, you know, they have gotten into two, uh, into the NHS effectively, which is quite important. I'm happy to see that, but you know, the next six months will be important. I think, you know, there's one thing that they did mention that I thought was uh, interesting and that could be a source of surprise revenues is agreements, distribution agreements or, you know, partnerships, basically third party methods of distributing this, whether that be in private uh, clinics or internationally. So keen to see what they do. But I completely agree with you. The jury is still out. We have to wait uh, a bit longer. Uh, but, you know, there's a risk here. This this one isn't isn't as I wouldn't say is as cut and dry. It's not as black and white. Um, uh, you know, the value here is still to be determined. Yeah, I mean, uh, what's the name? The CEO there said that um, our aim for the new year is to scale the product at a pace in order to acquire as large a user base as possible. Longer term vision is that people will become the platform that all frontline clinicians use. So, and also early on, this is the start of commercialization, which is. Okay, well, how long is this going to take? And also, I don't know. I, again, I've, I, to me, I've got no transparency on how big this could be, how much revenue they can derive from it. How do they? I mean, I remember Dom, you know, Dr. Tom Oakley came on the podcast and he said what would happen is you'd, uh, they'd pay us per monthly rate for it. Um, so, but yeah, it's, you know, uh, I suppose when they, if, they, if that drops and they've got a wide scale adoption, but I don't know how it's like a piecemeal kind of thing, isn't it? Certain, certain, certain trusts will use it and adopt it, and it doesn't mean it'll be rolled out. It doesn't work with like that, I suppose, does it? Because it's they're all quite yeah. autonomous, aren't they? They're, 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 the the um, the I'm assuming they're all quite autonomous. The, the trusts themselves, they all make their own decisions. Yeah. So it's not a case yeah. of uh, it'll be adopted. In one go by the NHS, you've got to do it bit by bit, I suppose. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's hard. It's hard to really get a grip on it. I agree with you. It's um, you know, in principle, I like the idea, and I, I also think that the COVID tailwind is helpful to them because of all of this need for remote working. You know what I mean? And remote correspondence and having it all done in a secure manner, in a regulated manner, because there's this C marked right. So this is you know, I like all that, and in principle, it makes sense. Um, now the execution of rollout is where the difficult, well, it's, it, it always is difficult, but this is what I'm watching. You know, I'm looking for those, um, those announcements that are coming in the next six months to see how they progress. I, I'd like to see one or two step change announcements on that. You know, we had one with the NHS, which is good. Fantastic. So I'm not, it's not all grim. I don't, it's the, it's just, you know, now is the challenge. The challenge is the next six to 12 months to see how they can get that adopted. And, and I don't disagree necessarily with um, spending money to get adoption established, right? Mm -hmm. So as in not necessarily making it very, it doesn't have to be extremely lucrative out from the outset, but if they can show and demonstrate that they get it adopted widely, that's the key. You know, yeah. it's kind of like, um, you know, with, um, you know, like with a lot of these internet companies are measured on click throughs, you know, rather than on revenues. Well, it's, it's, I would say it's similar for adoption here. You're trying to convert people to using this uh, widely, and once you do, then you can then you can build stronger revenues out of them. You know, once they've switched over, 
Uh, but you know, the first step is to even get it adopted widely. So that there, you know, that's the step that I want to see in the next six to twelve months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what? One of, my, one of the filters on my, I have a, a list of nine filters when I look at stocks. I try and put them through these filters, and uh, one of them is: can this be scalable? Um, Ten times its current valuation. Is there a roadmap? You know, to that uh, valuation. And as yet, mm-hmm. I can't see that roadmap for, for feedback at the moment. So that's the issue, you know. So, um, but with Polarian, you can. You can see even 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 with uh, you know just America, pretty much commercialized in that area, uh, top tier of. You could, from where I was originally, it was like almost you could, it's upscale ten times, pretty much. But uh, it's risen a bit now, but uh, still massive potential. Like you say, I, I, again, that could be, you know, if it's going to be this uh, pretty much the standard in pulmonary investigation sort of uh, tech, then um, it's huge, you know, massive. So there we are. But that's uh, that's what no, I agree. Point. I agree. They're distinctly different, definitely different yeah. uh, companies and different risk levels, and quite frankly, reflected in the share price. Yeah. You know, one, one's, one's gone up four times, and the other one's kind of, uh, you know, where, where it was the last time we spoke about it. Yeah. yeah. Marvelous yeah. stuff, Vadim. Thanks for that, fellow. We'll speak you next week. Excellent. Thanks, Justin. Good to speak to you. Okay, it's time for the top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours. They are at five. Alba, Mineral Resources. At four, On The Market. Uh, at three, Novasite. At two, Eurasia Mining, and at one, Ami Minerals. By the way, uh, on the market, uh, down a tad, tad, surprised by that. Profit, I think there's a seller in there. Uh, profitable, growing quickly. Um, yeah, very good. Novasight is down 5.5%. Uh, Eurasia Mining down 44 And Ami Minerals down 12 In fact, I think there's a bit of a sell-off today in the markets, <laughs> looking at that. In fact, Alba Minerals is down as well, 1%. So they're all down. So um, there we are. That's the flow of play, play of flow. Whatever it's called. Um, okay. Um, top five most liked RNSs are as follows. On Kimune Holdings, um, agreement with Cider C9 to profile COVID-19. At three, uh, sorry, four, Emotion PLC. Emotion extends contract with Mandolin Bay. At two, Seeing Machines. C extends leading DMS to occupant monitoring. And at one, sorry, two... Was my numbering system all over the place? So sorry. Employee option schemes and hostel closers. And at one, it's on the market, of course, um, interim results. Very impressive. They up 28% their revenue, even though it was COVID time and uh, the market was shut for a little bit. Uh, and they also uh, provided discounts of 1.8 million. So you could probably add that to the 10.2 million. They probably did 12 million uh, this first half. So very impressive, which is a 50% increase on uh, the first half in 2019. Uh, that's it for the podcast. Thanks for listening. Much was appreciated. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research.